Kaluru. Namaste. Uh, it's so a pleasure to, for me to be here back in India. I'm always welcome. That's why I'm so happy to be back again at GIDS. And today we're going to talk about uplifting your apps into the cloud. What does it mean and what is happening in the cloud space right now? First, I want to talk about digital transformation. And many people use that in their companies as a cliche. I think that digital transformation means that we developers, we are not only the smarter, we are also the most important people in the world because we are shaping the way that people interact with each other these days through software. Software is really changing the world because the software that we're producing today is changing the way that people interact with each other. So it's our responsibility to do the best software that we can do every day to shape people's lives for the better. That's why I trust so much in ourselves. We will shape a better world thanks to the code that we deliver today and every day in the next thousand years. And all of the discussions that we had in the past like five or 10 years, since Pat De Pat, uh, Pat, uh, Patrick Debois coined the term DevOps, and first initially it meant a contraction between the developer world development and IT operation sites. Now everybody's discussing these DevOps things. And I have to blame Gartner for coining uh, and creating uh, many of the problems that we're trying to solve today with the DevOps nomenclature. And, and why is that? Traditionally, you have two different teams in your corporation. You have the development team and you have the ops team. And people say that you have a wall of confusion between the devs and ops team. And I'll tell you why is that? The wall exists, the wall of confusion exists because you can't be friends with the people that screw your life every single day. <laughs> Developers are in charge of change. You're supposed to change things. And sometimes when you change, you break these things. On the other hand, the ops team is supposed to keep things running. And we all know that in IT. If you want to keep something running, don't touch. And how can you make these both teams uh, work together? Well, we need to establish some practices. We need to cooperate. We need to talk more. And some people are developing software that will shape the way that developers and operations can better interact with each other. So we don't have this kind of Mimi, oops, running through the internet. This one is of my favorites. Like, it's a programming syndrome. It works on my machine. I just do something, I deploy into production, and it's not my problem anymore. One of the issues with this approach is that we're not really changing the world while our, the code that we just committed to our repo doesn't get deployed to production. If we want to do something with the code that we just uh, crafted, we need to put that into production. Because for me as a developer, there is no bigger frustration than just having an idea, crafting some code, knowing that we could benefit some people, committing that, and having to wait six months for that to be deployed into production. It's a liability, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, and it's frustrating. We need to change that. And that's why uh, we're discussing DevOps a lot in the past five years. And that's why we're going to discuss this in the next, uh, next upcoming years too. We have not solved the problem yet. And one of the great things around the DevOps discussion was also that it brought to us the notion that every single application that we, that we deploy and develop to, uh, these days have three different things that usually break into production. That's why everybody usually discusses. Uh, when we deploy things into production, things break, usually because we have changes in three different areas, behavior, state, and environment. But I will not dig furthermore into this DevOps discussion. I want now to start talking about the evolution that we have in these three different categories in the past uh, years. First, let's talk about behavior. Behavior means code. And to craft code, we usually have a programming language. Can you imagine the code that you created? I don't know how many of you are that old. Fortunately, um, that old. So if you remember the code that you were producing using Java 1.0, Java 1.1, 1 
more than 20 years ago, and you can see the code that you can craft today at, with Java 10, you can see that you can be much more productive. You have much more tools. Technology has evolved. Now we can be better developers because the tools that we're using today also improved. We're talking about states, uh, we're talking about data, and you can see a lot, uh, uh, a lot to the changes that happened in the past uh, 20 years in the way that we handle data. In the past, we only had relational databases. We had a certain amount of records in our production systems. Now with the internet, with the cloud, and now with the internet of things, we just had an, an exponential increase in the amount of data that our systems need to process every day. So, so the tools change it too. Now we need to process much data in a faster way. We need to store them to, uh, to for a long time. Uh, it has implications in the way that we develop software. And third, and that's the point of the discussion from now on, the environment. The environment in the which our applications are running has changed a lot. As I mentioned before, we had like uh, mainframes, client server systems, the internet, then the cloud, now the internet of things, it changed the environment, it changed the platform in which we're running our applications, and let's discuss more about that. First, we had the sun. It was supposed to be a pun. I don't know if you get it. It was just a bad joke. Uh, if you think about sun, uh, all of the Java started with the internet. So for th those of us that were programming at the time, when the internet raised in the early 2000s, when everybody was using, discussing, and developing systems for the internet, it was a great time to be alive. It was a great time to be a developer. And on that time, we had like a, a what I believe to be one of that unique moments that we have in, in, in history. We, were, we had the monopoly, we had one big company that basically had like more than 90% of the market share in operating systems that basically dictated what developers would be able to use to craft their software into production. And then we had a lot of other, other different vendors that, leaded by Sun, decided to create something that was a community effort. We created, at that moment, uh, almost 20 years ago, J2EE, and what now we call Java EE. Yeah? That was a great moment. We created a lot of innovation. A lot of things have happened. And many people remember Java EE as a standard where, where you could safely port your applications from one application pro one application server provided to the other, I think Java E meant much more. First, cooperation between different companies and individuals where they could cooperate on something for a greater benef benefit and later, later, later then uh, compete against each other for the better implementation. But also Java E provided us one of the safest, most secure, and most reliable platforms ever in the enterprise world. One of the things that people forget, we, we, we've seen in the past months and years, we have like these big security breaches where your privacy, your personal information is being leaked and used in improper ways uh, on, uh, by third parties. Uh, and one of the great, I think one of the greatest benefits for Java in the long term is that we as developers, we're not supposed to keep solving the same problems again and again which means that once we solved one problem with our software, our, that software is supposed to keep running into production for many and many years. And how do we guarantee that we, the software that we deploy into production is going to have the bug fixes applied? And I think in this case of data breaches, more important, how can we guarantee that the, the critical security vulnerabilities will be fixed in a timely manner? Java E provided the first big platform in which software developers could rely upon. We could deploy our software, we could develop our software and deploy our software using the Java E stack. We could put that into application server uh, into production and we could be assured that as long as we were paying the subscription, yeah, the security vulnerabilities would get fixed in a time and manner and that's how the software written in Java E is still running today. So we had all of this reliability, we had all of the safety, the security. 
and then something changed. Now the weather, we had the sun, the sun set, and came the clouds. Uh, we have many clouds. We have like cloudy weather, we have a turbulent um, uh, environment in which we need to develop our new applications. Most of us are still learning how to deploy or to how to craft these new cloud native applications that we need to deploy into one, into many, into public or private clouds. This is a challenging aspect. But I think one of the answers that we learned with Java E is no matter which solution do we choose in this new cloudy environment, we want something open. We trust in openness. We believe that open is a better way to be creating our solutions. So we believe in open source. We, uh, and me particularly as a software developer, I always believed in open source since the very first days, since the OSI. Uh, re uh, release the definition of what is open source, I always thought that it would be the best way for you to develop any kind of software. And I was very happy to see that as of 2018, open source can also be an economic model. And it's very, I'm very happy to see like many companies um, um, making money out of open source software because you know, uh, we can change the world with software, but it doesn't mean that we don't get paid for that, right? And we also believe in open standards. We believe that open standards with the collaboration of many different parties involved are better than just closed standards or proprietary standards. I'm not using Maven. Oh. And also in the past years, we had the discussion around containers, which is basically a node technology. But uh, everybody started discussing containers again because containers used to be something that only operators with root access could create. Containers are important today because developers have access to containers. We can create our own containers, images, we can package our applications, we can consume applications from third parties, and we can distribute our own applications using containers. So containers created a, a big revolution when we first started using uh, our, uh, our containers. Mainly uh, Docker was a great open source project that could benefit our developers for using this technology. But then after we learned how to craft our containers and consume these containers in our local machines and try to run a few applications containerized in the production environment, we learned that containers were not enough. We learned that running distributed applications or running containers into production was a challenging thing. So we needed something more, right? So some companies have been using containers for a long time. That's why uh, a few years ago, uh, Google approached Red Hat and decided to create an open source container orchestration platform, which we now call Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is based on the same production level code that Google uses to run our approximately, I think now it's more than that, two billion container instances per week. And we at Red Hat, we particularly believe that if Google can run two billion containers in production per week, you can run your 50 containers per month in your production environment in a reliable way, right? So what did they have? When you run containers in production, you have to face things like migration, your reliability, things go bad, containers go down, networks go down, hosts go down, you have a distributed problem, you have to know where your application is running. And in the past with the container uh, platforms that we had, we had to solve all of these by hand. With the modern, modern container orchestration platforms that we have these days, we have all of this already solved. So one of the greatest things of, uh, greatest benefits of the technology ways that we always ride into is that every single time when we face some problems, smart developers, they develop some solutions, and when that solution is established, they just push their solutions to a lower level of the stack. So we're not, as 2018, we're not discussing container orchestration problems anymore. If this fails, if it needs to be, uh, another instance needs to be started, it needs to be replicated, it needs to, be, it needs to be transparent. All of these problems are solved. And I think that the market chose Kubernetes 
an open source solution as their de facto standard. As of 2019, all of the major cloud computing providers support Kubernetes. Even the major cloud computing provider, uh, which has the largest amount of the market share, decided to support Kubernetes recently. So that's something that I believe it's a solution that has been done and proven. And if you want to choose a container orchestration platform, you're very likely to be using Kubernetes in the next months or years. And since you can see, uh, we're back, the Kubernetes logo is a uh, helm. So Kubernetes in Greek means helmsman, which is the guy that, or, uh, or girl, that pilots the ship uh, turning, turning the wheel. So we're using the analogy of sailing. Another great project that we have in the cloud space right now is Istio, which is a service mesh, which in other things you can add cross-cutting constraints to your distributed applications, something that used to be hard with Istio. You can use uh, add tracing uh, uh, and mirroring and routing transparently to your applications with Istio. They use, uh, Istio in Greek means sails, and they use a ship as a logo. And that's why I was very happy to see that just was publicly announced yesterday. Jakarta E is alive, which uh, you can consider that to be the now the, the new open source version of Java E, provided by an open standard, by an open foundation, the Eclipse Foundation. And they also chose a boat to represent it. So we clearly sailing, sailing is hard, but it's very nice to see that we're going to the right direction. And if you're thinking about solving more problems than just container orchestration platforms, maybe you want to take a look in another open source solution with the Red Hat OpenShift platform. And we believe that OpenShift, with the OpenShift application runtimes, will provide you with the same reliability and same security that Java E provided in the past. Now we have more than one stack than just uh, Java E. You, can want, you might want to use Spring Boot, uh, Wildfly Swarm, uh, Node.js, even Java E again, or even Vertex. If you want to use that in a support environment, you can choose Red Hat OpenShift runtimes to run that in the same reliable and secure way that you did in the past. That's what I had to say, and thank you, Bengaluru.